tucked away in a distant corner of Hollow Knight's map, away from the twisting caverns and dropping tunnels, is a bench. And this bench is under a tent. Normally, Hollow Knight uses black voids to represent the walls and present bounds that you can jump around in. But you can see past this tent wall, and there's more world out there that you can never touch. Hollow Knight is one of the best examples of an exploration-based game. The game is so open and perfectly tuned to make one of the most satisfying unravelling of a game map that you can experience. Each level in the game is crafted to make exploration as engaging and fun as possible. I have thought about how this game puts together its map in my head and it still puzzles me how close to perfection it is. And one factor in this is how Hollow Knight presents its areas. Each area in the game is hinted at before you enter, a room with moss patches inviting you into the lush green path then a room in a green path has bubbles hinting towards the fog canyon. These little build-ups to areas make the flow between areas cleaner and create mystery for the new zone. Let's take one of my favourite regions for example, the City of Tears. After using your new wall jump ability to beat a short platforming section, you pass through a heavy door that slams shut behind you. Then you are presented with new architecture and enemies for reaching a bench in front of a massive window. As you sit here with Quirrell, a friendly NPC you've met before on your journey, and stare out at the rain. Towers and buttresses fade out before you, but because of the 2D camera you can't see the full scale of the potentially huge cavern before you. You need to find out what is just out of view. And you do. You descend an elevator, and the music kicks in, and the rain patters and runs through the melancholic streets of this huge city. And this is a great thing for exploration game to do, hinting at and building up to a grand reveal. A castle in the distance, a volcano so far away it looks part of the skybox. And then when you do reach these places, it is such a satisfying feeling. But then a game can trick you. Tease a land that you never truly get to explore. And this brings us back to the bench at the end of the world. This bench is in the Kingdom's Edge. The literal name of the area tells you there's no more game past this. There is another space similar to this as well a tucked away viewing gallery in the Queen's Gardens. All three of the rooms in this game I've mentioned thus far are benches, save rooms. Benches are, mostly, safe places in Hollow Knight. They are calm little corners, away from the challenge and enemies. Their frequency only adds to the eye of the storm feeling. The song Reflection plays softly in the background. But while the City of Tears bench lets you soak in the scraps of information about the new area you are really entering, the other two benches never allow you to go beyond their walls, but there is stuff behind their walls. In Kingdom's Edge, there's what may be a vast tunnel of snow, or a waste leading out of Hallanath's shadow into a world far beyond. For the Queen's Gardens bench, I like to imagine that it looks out into a mass of untamed vegetation, the powers of Hallanath unable to tame further into the wild. The game also leaves small but interesting lore details about these areas. Kingdom's Edge is where a great worm once dug its way into the land and became the king you hear of so much throughout the game. Such a large being must have left an opening back into wherever it came from. Alubas, the passive gliders that float just outside this glass, are supposedly attracted to the resting places of beings with great power. What further power could lurk beyond, just out of sight? Okay, I know it's, it's probably Un, or the White Lady, but they're up here, and and this is down here, and anyway, just let me have this one, all right? With Silk Song hopefully just on the horizon, I and many others are desperate for anything Hollow Knight. We have devoured and mapped this game ourselves and as a community, so these places just beyond our reach are just so annoying but wonderful at the same time. It shows how this game, even after nearly six years of release, can still hold mystery and spark in its exploration that was so amazing when we first played it. However, these obscure places in Hollow Knight are small, out of the critical path and tucked away in the corners. But by using the same techniques in a crucial, important part of the game, they can be used for a drastically different effect. So I guess we're talking about Rainworld again for like a, a few minutes. At the climax to one of the most important sections in Rainworld, you finally reach the top of the huge superstructure that you've been worming your way up for basically half the game now. There are, again, two parts to this, the city and the horizon, 
but both work together to create a shocking landscape. The city is the only tangible connection you have to the ancients, the constructors of this ruined metal land. Everything you've been crawling through is just infrastructure to support this city. In this moment, it feels like it is the most important thing that you've ever seen, a purpose to all of this. Of course, you never get to go to this vault of knowledge just beyond the plane. It looms all throughout this entire room, completely dominating your vision, vibrant red and geometric windows catching your eye. There is basically no gameplay here at all, just a simple walk, nothing to take your mind off the city. But upon reaching the edge of the decaying hull of the structure, you can see past the ground you are standing from. This huge machine that dominates Rainworld's map is only one of hundreds of iterators that have their own fading cities crumbling atop. The thick layer of rain clouds block much from your sight, but green flashes of electricity confirm that each one of the massive hulls has sprawling systems and lands below, just like the one you stand on right now. Rainworld is not going to have endless sequels exploring each new land seen from this room. It's not feasible or necessary and this moment is so impactful as it shows what we will never reach. The journey too far, the truth too distant. Here the game is invoking the motion of insignificance by how little of the worlds you can ever explore in Rainworld's already giant map. You can take almost any moment from my favourite three chapters in the 2014 game Naissance and see the similarities to the idea I'm talking about immediately. Going down, interlude, and endless dive are where Naissance flips from its moniker and fever dream, platforming and claustrophobic black tunnels too well. Look at it. Walkways across inconceivably large voids between the city imitations warped beyond realism. Just an abyss of stuff. Again, it's the same concept as before, but instead of curiosity or insignificance, these views almost invoke fear. Agoraphobia is mostly the opposite of claustrophobia. It can mean other stuff too, but the exact definition of it explains that it can refer to being in places from which escape is difficult. And I feel like I'm going off on a tangent here, but the massive amount of places that you never get to go to in Naissance elicit this sort of empty, enclosed feeling. The huge cavernous environments and plains that stretch out into the dark never let you reach or touch or even glimpse the walls of these spaces. But as much as it feels like, and as much as I want to believe, that there are other people behind those distant lit windows, I know that there's nothing more than what I've already seen. Just endless masses of that labyrinth of pipes and teetering staircases from before, contextualised in a solid, encompassing growth of systems and their walkways, these caverns rendered tiny by the unseeable size of the superstructure, cracks of air in the crystal. You are trapped, not by the blind and shuttling hallways, but by that visible space that incites the deepest loneliness. Naissance is a game that uses about half of its short five hour runtime to push this larger expanse that you are never able to scrape out a path through. Its haunting atmosphere is derived from its environments and presentation of a larger, unattainable world that may hold any answers to all of this just out of reach behind one of these cold, blank walls. Or maybe not. Unreachable views can be used in a wide variety of spaces and games. From small, single rooms that create a deeper intrigue towards a larger world, as major moments part of an emotional journey, to all the way to supporting main aspects of a game to create its definitive atmosphere. This isn't every use of the concept, and this certainly isn't every game that uses it. Transistor and Pyre, two masterpieces from Supergiant Games, end with scenes similar to what I'm talking about in order to create emotional send-offs to their stories and narrative, and to show the player the culmination of their journey. Pretty much any recent game by From Software contains a little bit of this idea. Ash Lake, the end of Aldia's Keep, those chasms in the Chalice Dungeons of Bloodborne that open up to some sky somewhere. This game design idea isn't a good thing to use all the time, however. Too much of it may leave a game confusing and too sparse in its actual world that you get to explore. And sometimes the direct opposite is a far better option. Foregrounding a landmark to the player that lets you visit later creates a great, oh, I'm here now moment and a testament to great world design utilised by the Souls series far more than the places you cannot go. 
from the very beginning of journey you are given one goal get to the mountain It'd be a bit weird if you never got to go there but in certain carefully used places unreachable views can create some of the most memorable parts of games that remain in our minds long after we set them down and further prove the interactive power of emotion and storytelling that games can have. Hey, thanks for watching this video. I'm sorry for the delay since my first one, I had some uh, important stuff to do. But I'm glad I did finally get up and make another one of these, it was fun! Thanks loads for the amazing support on the last video, and I hope you like this one.